On January 26, 1921. 21? 21? 21? 21? 21. Welcome to this episode of History Told by Idiots. Finally. After Finally. Almost, how many times have we tried to record this episode? Well, like four. Like, oh, maybe yeah. four. four. Possibly five. Four. I don't know. Let's it's sn- been a while. Let's sneak this in while there's no school going on. Or... Yeah, Josh is out of school. Trey's out of school. I don't go to school. It's all good. It's <laughs> weather's in between summer and it's, like, and it's like, he goes to school, he works. Yeah. I also work during the summer, so... I work, I work too. Last you time know they tried that. to, it was just an incredibly insane day, and I just couldn't stand when I come back in the house. Yeah, Josh has got dead people finals over, over with, so it's all good. And we have Trey with us on this episode. We'll make him feel nice and welcome, as we usually do. Hello, Trey. How are you? I'm pretty good. <laughs> it's, been, <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been out on episode. I think it was the last episode I was on was when I talked about... Uh, I don't think Josh was here. I replaced him that time. Yeah. Before the pandemic. Way Jeez. before. You talked about TV, didn't yes. you? Yeah, that was the, the invention of the television. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Because right. we talked for your friend who was a teacher. Yeah, that was a good episode. It was the invention of like the icebox and the television. Shout out to Spencer County Spooky Squad. That's our ghost hunting yeah. friends, our ghost hunting buddies. Like Check them out on, on YouTube and on Instagram, Spencer County Spooky Squad. They yeah. just went to investigate the... See, here's the thing. I don't know if it's Rose Opera House or Ross Opera House. I've seen it both ways. Oh, well, I think it's Ross think it's Opera Ross. House. Oh, I'm pretty like, sure it's Ross. Where's, the, where's Ross? In, I've, I've heard of it. It's in Cynthia. Okay. Cynthiana. So they it had, is Ross. They went to go investigate Ross Opera House and caught some pretty cool stuff. So shout out to them. We love y'all. We love y'all. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So the, the way that this episode came about is that we have developed an email friendship with with a listener, and he knows who he is. Well, I'll just say, hello, Bill. So, Bill, this one is for you. Sorry, Bill, so, that it's taken so long. <laughs> so, sorry that it's taken us a thousand years to get to your episode, but we finally did. But he is a super nice dude. We've been corresponding via email, which is a segue to, if you have something you want us to talk about, please email us at historybyidiots at gmail.com. And we will do our very best to do an episode for you. Right. But he and wanted to talk about, he wanted us to talk about, rather, the Molly Maguires. Right. And I'm going to do a shameless plug. You can leave a comment on YouTube as well. Ha! <laughs> we do have a YouTube now. You we do. That will be YouTube fun. What's our, YouTube, uh, what's our YouTube channel name so the folks know, Joe? You do it. Yeah, it's just It's history. your frog. This is your thing. Yes, it is. It's just history told by idiots. So come and see us. Listen to Things You Can Never Unknow, which is now live on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Stay tuned for more exciting things. I decided I was going to talk about the Molly Maguires, and then I was like, hey, y'all, talk about strikes and such. Yeah. And I just let them go. So I have no well, idea what they've well, come it up was with. Actually, it was actually kind of funny because when you first told me what this was about, I was reading a newspaper about the 100th year anniversary of what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about the Battle of Blair Mountain. I mean, it's not really local, but it does affect... I mean, it is, but it isn't. The broad... Spectrum of Appalachia. of Appalachia. So me and Trey are collaborating on the Battle of Blair Mountain. To give a little bit of background of what happened, you've heard us talk about the coal industry here on History Told by Idiots. We're all very thankful for the coal industry here. It's touched our lives. Did you have coal miners in your family? Uh, my papa worked on a strip job as a mechanic, and my pap was a coal miner in Scotia. He was actually scheduled to go into the mine the day of the explosion, but quit because his dad told him, son, don't go. Oh, my God. Gosh. He said he just had a feeling. Wow. wow. If so. you guys don't know about the Scotia mine disaster, we'll just go ahead and plug a previous episode for the sake of learning what it was all about. Terrible disaster that happened in eastern Kentucky with the two mine explosions back to back, same mine. Right. Multiple deaths. Right. Absolutely and you, terrible. And your mama works at one well, of the local hospitals that deal with... Yeah, I, my, I, my uh, section is, I work at Mountain Comprehensive Health Corporation, which is a clinic here in Whitesburg. We do, the section I work here for is pulmonology. We yeah. work, we do black lung. We help people sign up for federal black lung. So I 
see, I can't say any specifics because of HIPAA laws, but right. like you see people who come in who can't breathe for the rest of their lives. They're on heavy blocks of oxygen and coal companies don't want to give money to these people when they definitely need to have compensation due to the, the amount of damage to their lungs. Right. And that's actually a cool, I'm sorry, not really a cool, but an awesome way to sum up about the Blair Mountain incident because it was about the unionization of coal. And a little bit of background behind it is, is the late 1800s, about 1870, coal had reached this region. So coal had reached the southwest uh, part of West Virginia. And actually, it's it's pretty awesome because where the Matewan County and Logan County line bumps up is where Pipeville's at. So it kind of bumps up really close to Pipeville. But to give a little bit of background, all up into Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, especially Pennsylvania, had been unionized. And basically what that means is if your company is unionized, then you have representatives. In short, you have representatives. So like I say, if you have a grievance with your company, you could go to your representative, representative fights for you. Instead of you trying to get lawyers and whatnot and taking the case on yourself. To set the scenario, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, coal camps was basically forced labor. It was called the Age of the Coal Barons. These coal miners would go day in and day out work ridiculous shifts for a dollar. How they got paid was by the ton. Whereas now we have laws against that and we work eight, nine, ten hour days and get paid a minimum wage. These poor coal miners did not get that. They also sometimes paid them in like funny money, as they called it. It would be money that would only be available for your company store. Scrip. That would be called Scrip. You owed your soul to the company store. There's even a song and it's absolutely correct. So, like, even though you would get paid a sum, you would get a deduction for rent for the house. You would have to buy the company's coal to warm your house. You would have to buy the company's grain. You would have to buy the company's clothes. And I remember growing up, my papa all talking about having to buy bronze picks and bronze shovels. And when you're slamming into hard rock all day long, what does bronze do? It breaks very easily. It's very brittle. So you would have to pay someone to get to sharpen it. Or get a new hammer, a new pick. All this was deducted, and by the end of of all the deductions, you was left with basically nothing. Either that or you owed the company. Either that or you owed the company. A large amount of people died owing the company store. Amongst all this dreary background, the Battle of Blair Mountain was known as the largest armed uprising of labor since the American Civil War. Conflict occurred in Logan County, West Virginia. And it was part of a series of battles called the Cold Wars of the 20th century. Up to 100 people were killed and many more were arrested. The United Mine Workers saw a major decline in membership, but the long-term publicity led to somewhat improvements in work conditions. A little bit of the background of the UMW. Tessa, I'm sure you're familiar with the UMW. The United Miners Work. Yes, because your father was a coal miner and my papa was a coal miner. It was the largest mine workers union. So, the United Mine Workers Union in 1890, coal mines in Mingo County, West Virginia, the surrounding areas only hired non-union workers. So basically what that meant was is that they was getting cheap labor. And they strictly enforced employment contracts that included union members as grounds for an immediate termination. What that meant is that before you're unionized, the coal mines could basically fire you for no reason whatsoever. Just because they wanted to. Just because they wanted to. When the coal companies would fire you, this would also mean that you would get evicted because you could no longer pay for your house. Which the company owned. Which the company owned. And this was very bad because coal miners sometimes would have two, three, or in my family's case, 12, 13 Let me kids. Tell you right now. Yeah, kids. Yeah. My great grandfather on my dad's side, my papa was the youngest of 14 kids. Right. That was pretty common. Yeah. Papa Cottle and Mama had eight. Granny grew up with eight kids. In 1920, the UMW's new president, John L. Lewis, who's going to be a very important figure, sought to finally end the three-decade resistance to unionization in the area. Basically, what was happening was he was looking around, and kind of like much today, all the money was going to other places except for where it needed to go. John L. Lewis sought to finally end the three-decade resistance to the unionization in the area. He was under increased pressure to do so from both miners elsewhere who participated in an earlier strike in 1919. And from affected mine operators who were now being undercut by non-union mines in West Virginia. 
So basically, if I'm going to pay you this, why would I pay you this when I could pay this guy this? And he's working without arguing. You go on strike, we bring in scabs. That's how it works. That's pretty much it. Yep. Uh, there was fiery speeches from local individuals. We should probably explain what a scab is. Okay, so a scab um, is when miners would strike. They would bring these other people in, sometimes from... Sometimes they were local, sometimes they would bring them in from quite a ways away or another town over or whatever, and they would be willing to work for whatever the company wanted them to work for. Like, if right. you went on strike, somebody would replace you. Somebody would be there to replace you. Yeah. So. That's a scab. But the unionization pushes included figures such as Mother Jones, who was a lady of the community, and she was age 83, and she was standing up against these strike breakers and stuff. And a gentleman by the name of Frank Kenny, he was the president of the local union district. And over 3,000 Mingo County miners joined the union, and all were fired. The coal companies then hired the agents of Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency to evict the families of these former coal miners. They basically had hired a private military organization. Yes. To the, force these people out. To force these people out of their homes. Because Excuse they me. were jerks. Yep. On May 19th, 1920, a dozen Baldwin Feltz detectives, including Lee Feltz, arrived in Maitland, West Virginia, and connected with Lee's brother, Albert Feltz. Albert and Lee were the brothers of Thomas Feltz, the co-owner and director of the private detective agency. Albert had already been in the area and tried to bribe the mayor with a $500 bribe to place machine guns on the roof of the house, or on the of the town. Holy crap. Teasterman, who was the mayor, refused. That afternoon, Albert and Lee, along with 11 other men, set out to Stone Mountain Coal Company property. The first family they came to was evicted, was a woman and her child. The woman's husband was not at home at the time. They forced them out at gunpoint, threw their belongings in the road, which at that time, it was cold and raining. Awesome people. The yes. min- the, the miners who saw that obviously were furious, and word spread around the town very fast. So as the agents was walking to the train station to leave the town, the police chief by the name of Sid Hatfield, who a very important figure also, and a group of deputized miners confronted them and told them they were under arrest. So this is deputized miners telling a federal agency, you guys are in trouble. (laughs) We're about to dish out Appalachian law. Appalachian justice, baby. Listen, Appalachian justice is scary justice. It's very scary justice. Albert Feltz replied that, in fact, he had a warrant for Hatfield's arrest. So the agency had a warrant for the sheriff's arrest, (laughs) the police chief's arrest. I don't think he cared, probably. He did not care at all. The mayor was alerted, Teasterman was alerted, and he ran out into the street after a miner shouted that Sid had been arrested. Hatfield backed into the store, and Teasterman asked to see the warrant. After reviewing it, Mayor Teasterman explained this is a bogus warrant. With these words, a major gunfight erupted and Chief Hatfield, he shot the agent Albert Feltz and Teasterman, Albert, and Lee Feltz were among the 10 men killed. Three from the town and seven from the agency were totaled killed. It's a horrible way to go. And a lot of these men were former World War I draftees. Right. In the war, and so they all had combat training on both sides. On both sides. In other words, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. The gunfight went down in history, and I know you've heard this before because me and Dad said this before, as the Mate One Massacre. Yeah. And it was the Kickstarter. It was the, the significant symbolism that would kick the miners into action. The seemingly invincible detective agency, Baldwin Feltz, had been beaten. So Chief Sid Hatfield became an immediate legend and hero to the Union miners and a symbol of hope that the oppression of coal operators and their hired guns could be overthrown. Throughout the summer into the fall of 1920, the Union gained strength in Mingo County as it resisted its co-operators. All throughout this time, in late June, state police, under the command of Captain Brokus, raided the Lick Creek Tent Colony near Williamson. They raided a shanty town. Basically. They basically raided a shanty town, looking for weapons and looking for uprisers. These were miners said to have fired on Brokus and Martin's men from the colony. And in response, the state police shot and arrested miners, ripped the canvas tents to shreds, and scattered the mining family's belongings. Both sides were bolstering firearms, and Sid Hatfield continued to fuel the resistance, specifically by converting Teasterman's jewelry store into a gun shop. Hmm. 
So now we're getting a little bit more steam here. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. On January 26, 1921, the trial of Hatfield for killing Albert Phelps began. It was in the national spotlight and brought much attention to the miners' cause. He was seen as a mythical figure in the miners' community. We and, have several of those around here yeah. yes. that are seen as and, mythical figures. And so, because of this, he posed and talked to reporters, fanning the flames of his own legend. He was like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> All men were acquitted in the end, but overall the union was facing significant setbacks. 80% of mines had reopened with imported replacements and extractors who signed yellow dog contracts to return to work. We talked about scabs. You either had a scab come and replace you. Or somebody who betrayed your cause. Or yep. somebody who betrayed your cause. And the yellow dog contract basically was that you signed a contract saying that you would not unionize. That no matter how much money was thrown at you, you would not betray your company. In mid-May 1921, union miners launched a full-scale assault on non-union mines. In a short time, the conflict had consumed the entire Tug River Valley. It's like a turf war. Yep. It was. These three-day battles were finally ended by a flag of truce and the implementation of martial law. That'll do it. From the beginning, the miners perceived the enforcement of martial law as one-sided, as they should. Yep. Hundreds of miners were arrested. The smallest of the infractions could mean imprisonment, while those on the side of law and order were seen as immune. The miners responded with guerrilla tactics and sabotage. So basically, it's like, the start of Vietnam War. We was almost like getting ready to have... The uh, hills were speaking banjo. Yeah. It <laughs> the hills was like, were speaking banjo. It was like the Vietnam War early on in time. The trees have eyes. Could you imagine you're an import from like Pennsylvania. You've never seen Appalachia before. <laughs> yeah. And you're just in the mountains somewhere. <laughs> right. And you, just, and you just start getting gunshots peppered at you. You're scared out of your you're mind. You're scared out of your and mind. And it happened. It happened. It happened. In the midst of the tension, Hatfield traveled to McDowell County. You remember the... The legend. On August 1st, 1921, to stay in trial again on charges of dynamiting a coal tipple. This man, he could have just, you know, destroyed it. He didn't have to blow it up. All you have to do is set it on fire and you can't really use a coal tipple. Oh no, he right. was going to do it good. He was going to do it. He was going to do it good. Along with him traveled a good friend, Ed Chambers, and their wives. But unfortunately, as they walked up the courthouse stairs, unarmed and flanked by their wives, a group of Baldwin Feltz agents standing at the top of the stairs opened fire. Hatfield was killed instantly, Chambers was bullet riddled, and rolled to the bottom of the stairs. Despite Sally Chambers' protests, one of the agents ran down the stairs and shot Chambers once more point blank in the back of the head. Wow. That is what we call an assassination attempt. Yep. yep. That's absolutely, it's not even an attempt, yep. that's a straight up assassination. It's like, it's like Braveheart. They finally tried to cut the head off the, off the, off the beast, off the beast, but obviously. All that does is fan the flames. All it does is fan the flames. Both what? their bodies were returned to mate one. Question. So this is West Virginia, so was that Hatfield related to the Hatfields? I'm pretty sure, sure he was. was. I'm pretty sure he was. Who yeah. would have thought that the Hatfields were not rational people? <laughs> <laughs> Who would have known? Who would have known? <laughs> and word of the slang, as word usually does in the mountains, spread like wildfire. This caused 10,000 armed people to show up. 10,000, yes. And we're getting to that. So, the miners, of course, were angry that Hatfield had been murdered, and knowing that the assassins would escape punishment, began to take up arms and pour out of their mountain settlements. Miners along the Little Coal River, among the first to organize and begin action, such as patrolling and guarding in the area. Sheriff Don Chafin sent Logan County troopers to Little Coal River area, where armed miners captured the troopers, disarmed them, and sent them fleeing. But on August 7th, 1921, the leaders of the UMW, of District 17, which encompassed much of southern West Virginia, called a rally at the state capitol in Charleston. These leaders were Frank Kinley and Fred Mooney, who were veterans of previous mine conflicts in the region. Both were local, well-read, and articulate. Kinney and Mooney met with Governor Ephraim Morgan and presented him with a petition of the miners' demands. And that's like me taking my head and busting it up against the wall. It did absolutely no good because... He's company owned. Yes. As were every local government of that time. Money in the pocket. Yes. If you ask some people, it still is, but that's besides the point. Yep. This made You're the, not wrong. This obviously made the miners more pissed off. At the rally of August 7th, a figure by the name of Mary Harris, Mother Jones, called on the miners to march into Logan and Mingo counties and set up the Union by force. So, they did just that. They began gathering at Lens Creek Mountain near Marmot, in Kanawha County on August 20th, 
Four days later, an estimated 13,000 had gathered and began marching towards Logan County. Jeez. Impatient to get to the fighting, miners near St. Albans and Kanawha County commandeered a Chesapeake and Ohio freight train, renamed the train the Blue Steel Special, to meet up with the advance column of marchers at Danville and Boone County. On their way to Bloody Mingo is what they decided How to do. How do I not know any of this? Right. Now, the funny part is the sheriff's office, who was in the company's pocket, heard about this. They decided to set up 10 miles of defensive positions north of the town of Logan along ridge lines stretching from Blair Mountain northwards to Mill Creek. The battle would continue from four days. He was financially supported by the Logan County Co-operators Association. Of course. And they created the nation's largest private army force. So, the first skirmishes occurred on the morning of August 25th. The bulk of the miners were still 15 miles away. The following day, President Warren Harding threatened to send in federal troops and Army Martin MB-1 bombers. Oh, wow. So, and you got to put in perspective, too, the plane hadn't been invented for too long. For too yeah. long. Yeah. And it's you all, in some trouble. Well, most of the men had seen these biplanes because they fought in the war before. Right. And so, but I couldn't imagine if you were like a young miner, maybe like 15, 16 years old, and you haven't seen or heard anything like that, right. and all of a sudden you just start hearing a plane and... The, the first official use was in Gosh. World War One as they used them as reconnaissance planes, but then used them as bombing planes. By August 29th, battle was fully joined by Chafman's men. Though outnumbered, they had the advantage of higher positions and better weapons. So the sheriff and all of his men and had a better position because they were up higher on the ridge line. Private planes were hired to drop homemade bombs on the miners. Oh God. Yeah. A combination of poison gas left over from World War One. And explosive bombs were dropped in several locations near the town of Jefferson. Where do you procure leftover poison gas? Yeah, remember from the, federal, the, federal government. the federal government sold everything. You could get machine guns, poison yeah. gas, armored cars. Yeah. You didn't even have to have a license for a machine gun until I think, what was it, 1980? So, right. yeah, we had World War One debt to pay off. Yep. So, all these explosives yeah. and all this poison gas were dropped by the towns of Jeffrey, Sharples, and Blair. At least one did not explode and was recovered by the miners. It was used months later as evidence for the defense during treason and murder trials. On orders from General Billy Mitchell, Army bombers from Maryland were also used for aerial surveillance. One Martin bomber crashed on its return flight, killing the three crew members. On August 30th, Morgan appointed Colonel William Eubanks of the West Virginia National Guard to command the government and volunteer forces confronting the miners. Sporadic gun battles continued for a week, with the miners at one time nearly breaking through the town of Logan and their target destination. The non-unionized counties to the south, Logan and Mingo. Up to 30 deaths were reported by Chafin's side and 50 to 100 on the Union miners' side, with 100 more injured or wounded. Chafin's forces consisted of 90 men from Bluefield, West Virginia, 40 from Huntington, and 120 from West Virginia State Police. Three of Chaffin's forces, two volunteers, and a deputy sheriff were killed. Take note, the West Virginia State Police have never officially apologized for this incident to nobody. Really? No. no. And one miner was fatally wounded. Federal troops ended up arriving by September 2nd. The Many of the miners who had served in the war still had that camaraderie. Because of this, they didn't want to fire upon their fellow troops. They basically laid their guns down. They didn't want to fight the United States Army. Right. So because this, they this, were the United States they Army. They were the United States Army. By the time it was all over, the battlefield had 1,700 acres in total, with heavily forested steep slopes, ridge lines, earthworks, foxholes, and everything else. You can still find buried guns and everything at right. this battlefield to this day. Right. Uh, because as the miners were fleeing, they, they were hiding their weapons. Right, right. But after the battle, some 985 miners were indicted for murder, conspiracy to commit murder, accessory to murder, and treason against the state of West Virginia. Which I didn't know you could just commit treason against one state. One state. Right. Nor did I. Though I, some were acquitted by sympathetic jurors, others were imprisoned for years. The last was paroled in 1925. Wow. And at Blizzard's trial, the unexploded bomb was used as evidence uh, against governor and company's brutality, and they all were acquitted. So. Wow. And he was acquitted, and Blizzard was the leader. So basically, that was the Battle of Blair Mountain. And the legacy of it is that the UMW saw a dramatic decrease at the time in unionization. Over a short time, it gathered its population back. It gathered its members back, and it changed its name to the UMWA. UMWA, United Mine Workers Association. Association. 
yes. which we know of today. And so in today's world, it also has a regional level impact culturally. The conflict helped foster the Appalachian stereotype relating to hillbillies and rednecks. The term redneck actually comes from this battle was fully cemented by it due to the army of miners wearing red towels to signify so people know that we're miners who stand with the Union and not these yellow bellies, as they called them. Huh. I didn't know that. The mainstream media of its day and powerful corporate interests blamed the violence on the backward mountain culture of the miners, promoting an an unhistorical narrative that has shaped the way Americans view Appalachians and how Appalachians view themselves. And so basically, the companies poured all this money into newspapers to paint it in their way. Right. Yeah. And so the battlefield's actually under threat currently. Yep. Threat to the historical battlefield has long been recognized. In 2006, the National Trust for Historic Preservation Preservation <laughs> words include <laughs> words history told by idiots, not scholars. Exactly. Oh, yes, exactly. That is. That is. <laughs> Preservation listed the site on America's 11 most endangered historical places. On March 30th, 2009, the Blair Mountain <laughs> Battlefield, covering 16,069 acres, was listed as the National Register of Historic Places for its importance to labor history. Social history and politics with 1921 as the period of significance. Soon after the listing, coal companies that held permits to mine the area sued West Virginia state officials who had supported the nomination. The companies also formally appealed the decision to list the battlefield in the National Registry. Within nine months of having been listed, the registry, the site was delisted. Now, there are two reasons for this. Some of those companies are descendant of the company that was there. Right. And they don't like young folk knowing about that. Oh, there were strong unions. Now, take note when I say this. This place used to be what I'm going to call heavy union territory. Up until what? When did we historically, like 1990s? Yeah, something like that. Probably. And so now it's very heavily anti-union area. Now, I myself am part of a union. Mm -hmm. I'm part of the Kentucky's Educator Association. And so that's two reasons why they don't like it. And they also say, oh, we have coal claims there. And the reason why they have those coal claims is because they're the descendant of that company. Right. Granite they dirt. basically just don't want the bad publicity that this happened. Right. Yes. Right. Especially since coal is already declining anyway. Yes. But they don't want to make themselves look even worse. In September 2010, several groups, including the Sierra Club and a newly formed Friends of Blair Mountain, or the FOBM, filed a lawsuit challenging the delisting. U.S. Court Judge Reggie B. Walton vacated the delisting on April 11, 2016, declaring it to be in violation of federal law. He then referred the matter back to the keeper of the National Registry, who is now deciding whether to relist the site. There are currently three surface mining permits, one belonging to Arch Coal, under the company names Bumbo No. 2 and Adkins Fork, and one is Alpha Natural Resources Camp Branch. I I know one of these companies don't exist anymore. I think Alpha. Alpha don't exist anymore. Arch, I think Arch still exists. Arch exists, but I think they bought Alpha stuff. So mm-hmm. it's just right. Alpha is left. I think, I know Arch collapsed under itself. They yeah. couldn't hold, even with bankruptcy, they couldn't hold itself up anymore. These three surface things damage not only the preservation efforts of the towns that, well, the remains of the towns that are still there and the earthworks and artifacts that can still be found. You can still see the trench lines and the dirt and stuff. You can really? walk in them still, yes. Right. So they also want to timber this area as well, but we don't want them to do that because that we could get rid of possible bullet holes and trees and stuff right. like that. And so, Essentially erasing the footprint of history. Yes, right. currently there are no active timber operations, but there are no legal protections for this site concerning timbering, unlike places like Gettysburg and different places like that in America where you can go find bullet holes and homes and different things like that. Right. So much depends on the forthcoming decision of the Keeper of the National Registry. If the decision is for the battlefield to remain delisted, it is an unimportant decision, then Arch Cole may proceed with his attempt to surface mine Atkins Fort permit. If the keeper rules to relist it, then it will be protected from mining permits, and there will be more time to work toward a permanent solution for the site. As it should be, it should be listed right. in the National Register of Historic Places. And it still isn't. So if you would like to complain uh, to you multiple should. people, I've got your information here. Right. They say history always goes with the side of the victor, but history is important for both sides. So yes. we're coal kids, you know, we have grown up in the heart of coal industry. It's not like we're against the coal industry because no. we're not. That's what put my food on the table and clothes yes. on my back. I just don't like it when, as as a kid in school, you never hear about this. Or right. I, well, I've never heard of it. Right. Never. And like what was cool too is the archaeology project that they sent in to try to find artifacts and stuff. 
I think they found what over like a million bullets or something like that. Gosh. They've only found like over a million casing rounds and stuff like and, that. Uh, wow. they, it's one of the only areas in the United States, like unlike Europe, where we may actually find the live hand grenade or something like that. Like yeah, scarily. you may find ra- like live ammunition. And so <laughs> wow. you have. So if you would like to contact people, I would suggest you contact Governor Jim Justice through his email or his office telephone or his telephone in the governor's mansion. Flood them with Flood uh, them. requests. Also, their state senator, Richard Ojeda, for that part of the Charleston, West Virginia area. Because it needs to be on the or, National Register. Or flood U.S. Senator Joe Manchin. Or U.S. Senator Shelley Moore Capito and tell them history told by idiots sent you. Yes, <laughs> we sent you. Yes, because this does. You this know, is where it starts. I was wondering where it was going to start. <laughs> and so, regardless of whether you're for coal mining, against coal mining, whether you, I mean, it doesn't matter. It no. it ha- history. It, it's history, and it happened. And right. the people that died deserve to have some kind of recognition for at least fighting for what they believed in. You know. And the innocent people that lost their lives in, in the melee, because that's insane. Right. I don't know how I didn't know about this. Now, the repercussions for this are huge, because it affected the way we still view ourselves as, like, rednecks and hillbillies and stuff like that, and that we are can go nothing beyond doing coal mining. Right. How, until recently, where it's been forced upon, where kids either leave or... It's not an option now to go underground fresh out of high school no. like it used to be. When I came out of the high school, there were five mines open. Currently in Letcher County, there is one mine open, and it is a non-union mine. And there is two in Perry County, I think. There isn't many left. Yeah. yeah, not, yeah. And it's dramatically changed everything about our region, but... We're here. We're here, and we're still going. We're still... As hardy as ever. We may be a couple thousand people less in county numbers, but, yep, don't underestimate Appalachian justice. That's the moral of the story behind all of they this. They will don't listen. Don't ever underestimate Appalachian justice. Could you imagine, you know, you're just some boy that's been hired from, like, upstate New York, whatever. They hire these people from, I don't know where this local place is from. Literally everywhere sometimes. Everywhere. And so could you imagine you just hear 10,000 people who have probably more conflict experience than you, willing to lay down their life for a cause. Yeah. That's scary. It is scary. Probably much more than you. You're here for a paycheck, they're here for their livelihood. Right. Especially that, that on, the, the, on the heels of, of war that we just got out of. It's like lay down your life for one cause and come home and have to lay down your life for another cause. Some of these coal miners was probably in the Civil War. Yeah. So... The most, they were probably in their 70s. I couldn't imagine fighting, basically, you know, a war, your son fighting a war, and then having your livelihood stripped away right. from you. And so, could you imagine the president? He's like, oh, Lord, this could be the start of the Civil War Part Two if we don't know something about this. <laughs> I feel like American history is just delaying Civil War Part Two. Yeah, for real. I think my favorite part was I was listening, so I introduced a friend to our podcast at Alice Lloyd. Sweet. Cool. And so we were going through it. And we get to the episode of, he said he got to the episode of right during the uh, Capitol riots. And Josh goes, be a revolution. (laughs) (laughs) And he he just cried. And he said, I cried. He said, I wasn't expecting it. (laughs) And so. Shout out to your friend. (laughs) And so I feel like we're just, America's history is just delaying Civil War Part 2. Until we're eventually not going to be able to delay it anymore. Yeah, I agree. I agree. (laughs) Will we survive Civil War Part 2? Find out on the next episode of Dragon Ball Z. (laughs) I want to read you something. I was actually sitting over here looking up notes on Bloody Harlan. Have you heard? You probably heard about Bloody Bloody Harlan. Harlan. Right. So Bloody Harlan is another mind strike that we had. Which is closer to this area. Very close to this area. But I just happened to come across this which side are you on by florence reese and she pretty much captures the spirit of the tom that's a song isn't it right 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 and the chorus says which side are you on which side are you on which side are you on my daddy was a miner and i'm a miner's son and i'll stick with the union till every battle's won they say in harlan county there are no neutrals there you'll either be a union man or a thug for j.h blair Oh, workers, can you stand it? Oh, tell me how you can. 
Will you be a lousy scab, or will you be a man? Don't scab for the bosses, don't listen to their lies, as poor folks haven't got a chance unless we organize. What we're saying here is that Appalachians, if you messed with us, we woke up that morning and chose violence. Yes. We we're, still do. We still do. <laughs> we still do. We still do. We're, we're open to choosing violence, apparently. So just, you know what? So just don't. <laughs> yeah, so just, just don't. don't. All right, Tessa, tell us the main focus of the episode. episode. I'm going to tell you as much as I have possibly found about the Molly Maguires. What do you know about Molly Maguires? Right. No, little to nothing. Little, perfect. Okay, right, well, little, little okay. Little. Travel with me, if you will, to Ireland in the 1840s. Actually, we're going to start in Pennsylvania in 1833. The coal industry has really been born when they figure out that anthracite coal is can be used for smelting iron. We know this. We know this. And that's where, where the coal industry really began to boom. So just remember that in the 1830s, 1840s, Pennsylvania is the place to be. In Ireland around this same time, they're facing war, poor living conditions, no jobs, no money, and famine. famine. Exactly. And famine. Potato. The potato famine, 1846. A potato famine comes through. It destroys the crop for the entire year. By the way, I want you to know that the potato famine was totally preventable. Yeah, pretty much. It was totally preventable. The only reason, you know why? Because the British wouldn't give the Irish people more food, even though they had a surplus of food. Exactly, exactly. And since it was the main diet staple for most Irish families, everybody starved. That's essentially a summation of that. People were starving. Their living conditions were terrible. So, at this time, Irish peasants were victims of what they called landlordism, which is how it sounds. In other words, the land that they used for their potato crop would support three times the number of people as the same land if it was sown for wheat, if that makes sense. And the tenants of that land, which were the farmers, would then turn back around and pay their landlords higher amounts of rent than could be obtained from the crops they were working. Well, gee, this sounds familiar. Exactly. Yeah. So, 1846, this famine has swept through, and it spurs on what they call the Irish Exodus, in which the Irish people decide to leave the country and immigrate. They had their hands forced, and so that's what happened. Thousands, millions would probably die if they stayed, because they couldn't feed everybody. So the people that stayed... Well, those that left became Irish immigrants in America, usually, or they went usually uh, to other places. Uh, or the people that stayed ended up forming what we call the Irish Rebel Army. Yep. And uh, you're not wrong. It's kind of weird. Like one of these people chose cool livelihood, and the other again chose violence. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? Guess who those people ended up? Guess raising? Who yep. the Appalachian people were descended from. <laughs> It's like, we chose violence. <laughs> Many of them sailed to South America, Australia, South Africa, but like you said, most of them chose to come to the United States. So during the 10 years following the famine, which this would be 1846 through 1855, more than 1,250,000 Irish immigrants came to the U.S. That's a lot of people. It raised the total number of Irish immigrants to 1,748,000 from 1819 to 1855. Like, wow, yeah. that's a lot. It's never been higher, ever, even no. when another famine struck. But making it to the U.S. was not easy, as we have seen from many historical accounts of people sailing across the ocean to the United States. A.K.A. Mm -hmm. Titanic. A.K.A. <laughs> Titanic, A.K.A. Mayflower. <laughs> John Holland, who was a settler that immigrated and ended up in Cleveland, Ohio, says, this quote, our ship was 10 weeks on the seas from Queenstown to Gross Isle, an island below Quebec, used as quarantine. Out of the total 225 passengers, the ship took on board in Queenstown, 35 landed. Oh, God. The rest of those poor people found their grave in the ocean, my two brothers among them. I heard later that 12,000 Irish immigrants died on that island. So, if you made it across the sea to America... Many people settled in the coal fields of Pennsylvania, which, as I said earlier, was booming at this time thanks to anthracite coal and the steel company. But this was not a land of dreams. No, no. Not a land of dreams. A land of pain. Well, firstly, when many Irish citizens immigrated, they were a lot of them were Catholic. And Irish Catholics were discriminated against heavily based on their religion and their heritage. Just because they were Irish and because they were Catholic... 
So you'd pass by a shop that had a sign in the window that said, now hiring for said position. And then down below it would be like another sign that would say, Irish Irish need not Not apply. apply. No Irish. So this basically forced their hands again because who will hire you? The dangerous jobs. The jobs that pay little, that they're that are physically grueling and demanding, aka Cold. the mines. Yeah. Either that or the factories. Which yep. we ch- Which one choose. do you want to choose? Burn alive they in both, a cauldron of iron. They both suck. Right? Or, right. or get collapsed on in a mine. Which way do you think is easier to die from? So they left their overcrowded, starving existence to come to an overcrowded, also probably starving, new existence. They lived in these little overcrowded, company-owned houses. You talked about the company store and owing your soul to the company store. Well, that's how it was. You bought your food from the company store. You sent your kids to the company school. You visited company-owned doctors. You bought everything that you wore on your back Mm -hmm. at the company store. So the company controlled absolutely everything. It it had everything in its pocket. All these houses look the same, by the way. Actually, in this area around here in Letcher County, you can still see homes that still look all the same. Oh, yeah. We have a lot of coal camp towns around this area. They left one form of landlordism for another form of landlordism. That's all they did. And in many cases, like we said, they ended up owing their employers at the end of... Like, you get sick, and you go to the doctor... Maybe one of your children catches it. They go to the doctor. And at the end of the month, you owe the company money. Like, you have nothing. And they can kick you out on your rear anytime they want to because they own you. So, you can see how this would lead to tension, right? In the fall of 1862, (laughs) the draft happened. War had broken out, and miners were drafted to join this war, civil war, that they wanted no part of. They wanted no part in this. So you come into a country that has promised you freedom and food. (laughs) You have neither of those. You have neither of those. And then they're like, lay down your life for us. Right. They called it the rich man's war. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. But they resisted the draft and this led to outright rebellion. And this is when the Molly Maguires were really actually born in the United States. As this happened, Mon conditions continued to deteriorate we didn't have laws in place then that would protect year olds working in a mine exactly for 10 cents a day or less two pennies in a prayer (laughs) certainly not food or clothing we didn't have regulations back then to keep people safe and the company owned everybody it was miserable existence right they were sick and tired of owing their souls everything they owned themselves to the company so Rebellion breaks out after the draft because they don't want to fight for the country. They are tired of fighting the company. So they start fighting back. And that little spark of rebellion is what stuck around. Well, who would have thought that the Irish chose violence? Oh, they definitely chose violence. They woke up and chose violence (laughs) a while ago. You know, they chose violence, I don't know, about 3,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. So mining supervisors and scabs, we talked about scabs, started receiving what they called coffin notices. They're (laughs) coffin notices that you just wake up and find it on your door, you know? It would threaten your imminent death. And they were usually signed by Molly Maguires or pinned by somebody associated with the Molly Maguires. And so they're getting coffin notices. The violence is escalating within the actual mines and in the community until finally in 1864. Eleven mine bosses involved in labor disputes of one form or another are just killed outright in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. So, eleven mine bosses in one year. Side note, who is Molly McGuire? Thank you, because I was getting ready to be like, you missed something. (laughs) Well, her name can be traced back to the early 19th century in Ireland. She was an Irish widow who... In the 1840s, protested against English landlords who tried to steal people's land. She headed up a group called the Anti-Landlord Agitators. And they were known to get into bare-knuckled fistfights with their landlords in order to keep their land. Have you all just ever just, like, woke up one morning and just looked at your boss and said, I'm going to fight you? Well, strangely enough... (laughs) 
bare knuckles. Oh, he, but here's the best part. So she led up this group, and they would punch you in the face and be like, Take that from a son of Molly Maguire. And there we go. The infamy spread from that right there. Because they would say, Take that from a son of Molly Maguire. And the name so it was just one, of them, just one of them random <laughs> crazy Irish sayings. Just wham! Just. Well, I mean, because it came from her. She's the one that yeah. she's the one that started the group, the anti landlord agitators. So anyway, <laughs> that stuck around, and they brought it with them as they immigrated over. So now, on February twenty seventh, eighteen sixty five, state legislation comes through allowing mining companies to form private police forces hmm. with authority to make arrests and enforce the law on their own. Sound familiar? This force was called the Pennsylvania Cossacks, and their sole purpose was to kill violent strikers. That's all that they were there for. Wow. This did not go over well, as you can imagine. And by the end of 1866, five more mine managers slash bosses are shot and killed. So what we got? 16? Six, we got 16 dead so far. This leads to 1867. There's strikes over a wage cut which in turn lead to the formation of the Working Men's Benevolent Association, which soon becomes this member organization. It's a 30,000-member strong organization. And they say that they're going to help the miners, but really it's this organization that catered more to its own interests than miners and their needs. Surprise, surprise. Obviously. Obviously. Yeah. Because of this, and lots of prejudice against the Irish, they're like, you know what, let's just form our own group. So they do. They form the Ancient Order of Hibernius, A-O-H, abbreviated okay. in this. Hibernius? I don't have a clue. <laughs> you, uh, Josh, you mom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hibernius. Hibernius. The Ancient Order of Hibernius. That sounds like either Hibernians. one thing. Either like an ancient fey creature that'll swallow your soul, or, <laughs> or like... Ancient Order of Hibernians. Tell me that Google don't listen to you. Does it? Yeah, because I put an ancient and it was like... <laughs> <laughs> to join the Ancient Order of Hibernians, you had to be Irish or the son of an Irishman. And honestly, it was definitely a cover for the Molly McCars, who were, by all accounts, a completely secret group, by the way. Like, history knows they existed, but they're like, uh, did they... Yeah, they did. No, did they? Mm. But maybe they did. They probably did, but did they? They did. They're a secret group. They're, they're super they're, secret. They're about as secret as a terrorist organization. Yeah, they're about as secret as the Masons, right, Josh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me interject. Sorry. Okay, interject away. The Ancient Order of Hibernians, or AOH, is indeed an Irish Catholic fraternal organization. Members must be male. Catholic, and either born in Ireland or an Irish descendant. Its largest membership is now in the United States, where it was founded in New York City in 1836. Its name was adopted by a group of Irish immigrants in the United States. Its purpose, to act as guards to protect Catholic churches from anti-Catholic forces in the <laughs> mid-19th century, and to assist Irish Catholic immigrants, especially those who face discriminations or harsh coal mining working conditions. There you go. Many members in the coal mining area of Pennsylvania had backgrounds with the Molly Maguire's. Yep, yep, there you go. It became an important focus in Irish-American political activity. So who is Hibernius? Uh, I, I still know. can't figure that out. Once you were a member of the AOH, Ancient Order of Hibernians, AOH, you could be inducted into the Molly Maguire's. Remember, secret organization within an organization. You could be inducted into the Molly Maguire's if you impress them. They tried to make working conditions fair, the AOH did, but, I mean, it didn't work. And so, all of this led up to what they called the Long Strike of 1875, in which these mine operators decided to reduce wages, and this affected 10,000 miners, and that led to the Long Strike of 1875, which we're going to get more into that in a second. But So, the AOH are trying to prevent this from happening and trying to... Let everybody be paid fair wages and to be safe. And it, it did not work. It did not work. In 1868, a mine superintendent by the name of Alexander Ray is shot and beaten to death by what they suspect are four Molly Maguires. And chaos completely reigns supreme after this happens. And the coal companies are finally like, you know, we should probably put a stop to this. It's getting a little out of hand. It started to cut their bottom line. So what did they do? 
They hired a man by the name of James McParlin from the Pinkerton Detective Ooh, Agency. Pinkertons. Ooh, the Pinkertons. Ooh, I don't like them. They kill John Marston. I don't yeah. like them. Ooh, and, yeah. And it's getting serious when the Pinkertons it's come in. It's getting serious when the Pinkertons come in. So they hired James McParlin. During the long strike of 1875, McParlin comes in and assumes a new identity. He starts going by the name of James McKenna. It pretends to be an Irish immigrant worker who was fed up with the company. He was tired of it. Stick it to the man. Ready for change. So he basically craftily infiltrated the AOH. And he even swore an oath to the AOH in Schuylkill County and said, Oh, well, I'm already a member in Buffalo, New York, so I'll just change my membership here to the AOH. And from there, he sort of wormed his way in deeper and deeper until eventually he was initiated into the Molly Maguires. Meanwhile, this is going on and there's still more violence. Two supporters of a priest who was opposed to the Mollies are killed by unknown assailants. A mine watchman by the name of Frederick Hesser is murdered on the job. And this all culminates until in 1875, in March, the AOH and union leader... Edward Coyle is killed. Now they're getting their own attacked. The AOH leader is killed. Obviously, they didn't take that well. They didn't take it well at all. They really thought, they probably at this point, they realized we probably have a mole. Absolutely. June of 1875, so a couple months later, mining companies are now being pressured by the governor at the time, whose name was John Hartranft, into ordering 1,800 members of state militia to the area. So the companies were like, come on, governor, you give us military support. They brought in 1,800 members of the militia to put an end to the long strike. As you can imagine, right. it didn't go well. Uh, interjection okay. number two. Interjection number two. I'm, ready uh, for, I'm here for it. Hibernia is a simple classical Latin name for Ireland. Oh, oh. <laughs> who would have thought? Okay. Well, so, now we know. My favorite thing in the world is that the Romans chose to make that word. Take note, the Romans looked at Ireland, saw the naked Druid people running around it, chose to look at it and go, we've had enough of naked Druid people, and decided to leave it alone. Yep, that'll do. That'll work, man. That'll do. That'll do. But they still named it. But they still named it. Had to have something to call it while they were cursing it. Right. So, Edward Coyle, remember, who is the AOH leader, is killed in 1875 in March. A revenge attack for his murder is then planned by Jack Kehoe, who becomes the leader of the Molly Maguires. That may or may not exist, remember, because they're secret society, but they did totally exist. Yeah. Wink, wink, nod, nod. You got me. So, Jack Kehoe plans a retaliation for the murder of Coyle. And three Molly Maguires shoot this dude whose name is Bully Bill, I promise, that's what it says, Bully Bill Thomas, and they leave him for dead, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your train of thought, he survives. 1875 continues, at this point they know they have a mole, like you said, they know that somebody within the organization is working against them, plus you have Bully Bill who survives the attack, so some people are starting to get arrested and such, and that's when police officer Benjamin Yost is shot and killed while he's extinguishing a street lot in Tamaqua. They just shoot him. He's extinguishing a lot, they just roll up and shoot him, right? When this happens, there's outrage from multiple sides, because at the time, he wasn't doing anything. There's actually a historical marker, I think, at the lot now, where he was killed. He was eventually, his murderers were brought to justice, but we'll get there. So, 1875 was a banner year for the Mollies. They shoot and kill Officer Benjamin Yost. They shoot and kill Justice of the Peace, Thomas Coither, and a bartender named Gomer James, they shoot and kill Thomas Sanger, who is a mine foreman, and they shoot and kill another miner by the name of William Uren because he was a witness to the murder of Sanger. They shoot and kill mine superintendent John P. Jones. They shoot him in the back while he's walking along a pop line. So all this murder. <laughs> the entire time, James McKenna, who's actually James McParlin, our mole, is worming his way in and learning of all these plans. He's watching and listening and infiltrating, learning all this information. 
With his help and being a double agent, 60 men, over 60 men actually, were arrested in 1875. All of them are accused of being Molly Maguire's. Once they have all of these people arrested, it helps to defeat the long strike and bring it totally to an end. Despite the end of the strike, people were calling for justice because murder. Lots of it. Because murder. So people were calling for justice. Actual trials, here's where it gets sort of interesting too, because actual trials, they couldn't prove that the Molly Maguires even existed. So how do you prove that these men are the Molly Maguires if you can't prove the Molly Maguires exist? It's like, this is a defense lawyer's dream. They won't come right out and say that's who they belong to. And officials at the time and, and the coal companies don't want to admit that they exist because they don't want more people going to find them and joining up in their cause. So everybody's just like, no, they, they're not real, but they totally are real, right? They can't hold this up in trial. They can't hold this up in court because they can't prove they exist. Definitively, they cannot tie any of these men back to that organization and therefore cannot tie them to any crimes perpetrated by the Molly Maguires. But in the end of it all, they did try them all, all 60 of them, individually. That's a lot of trials. Wow. Mm -hmm. They tried them all individually, and 20 of those 60 men were sentenced to hang. So on June 21st, 1877, two years later, those 20 men that were linked to the Molly Maguires were tried and convicted of murder, were hanged in Carbon and Schuylkill County prisons for first-degree murder. Because of the prejudice and hate shown to Irish immigrants at the time, plus the biased opinion of James McParlin, because the court pretty much based their entire case on this one dude mm -hmm. that they sent in to be a mole. They based their entire court case around it, and they were like, yeah, these 20 men did it, let's kill them. But later, after reviewing all of this prejudice, all of this hate, he was biased, his biased opinion, the trials were recognized as unjustified. In 1979, the state of Pennsylvania gave the Molly Maguires and their leader, Jack Kehoe, a complete full state pardon over 100 years after they were hanged. Y'all ever just kill 30 people <laughs> and get a complete pardon? Yeah. You know, I'm all for union activity, <laughs> but I'm not out here shooting superintendents. Yep. June 21st is known as Black Thursday in uh, Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, and I, I guess I guess maybe in if you're from Pennsylvania, you can tell us, you know, what you know. Do you know Black Thursday? Do you know anything about the Molly Maguires? And there's a pretty interesting historical marker that's there's a couple that are up now that sort of document this. But did I know anything about it before research? No, Absolutely I didn't. Not. I did not. So did you? Because no, you do now. No, I do now. No, I don't. You do now. You know, that ended up being kind of a heavy episode. <laughs> it did, but like, it wasn't as heavy. It's not last episode. No, it's no, no, no it's not no, last episode. It's not last episode. It's not Albert Fish. It's not Jim Jones. No, Tessa. and those are all me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, but not sorry. Well, actually, Junko Files was you, so. Yeah, Junko Files was you, I'm friend. not sorry for that. Yeah. At all. It's important to our culture, for sure, around here, all of these mind wars, man. Part yeah. of history, it deserves to be talked about and recognized right. for what it is. So you taught me a thing, y'all, and I taught you a thing. Yeah. So absolutely. we taught each other a thing, and hopefully we taught you a thing, too. Speaking of history, I go to Gettysburg at the end of this. I know. I'm so July. jealous of I'm you. I'm jealous of that. I'll report back on that. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll, I'll send pictures. This was a good episode overall, I felt like. Very productive. Very, very productive. Very murder -filled. Very smart. Very smart <laughs> very and murder-friendly. Murder yeah. It's just like, and so... And what we've learned today is that the Irish and their descendants, the Appalachians, wake up in the morning <laughs> and, choose and choose violence. Oh, yeah. And by the way, the current AOH yes. denounces all the violence. So. Oh, well, there you go. You know what that tells me? Is that somewhere within the depth of that organization. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> that the Molly Maguires probably still exist. They still exist and yep. they're like, we don't regret the violence. <laughs> and then they're like, we don't regret the violence. And it's just like... Don't come at us. Don't come at us, AOH. Don't come at us because, listen, we think mine workers deserve the very best in the world. Oh, yeah. We appreciate and love our miners yep. and our heritage and our history. If oh, you know more yes. about either of these topics or Feel about Bloody to. Harlan, we would yep. love it. Oh, if I'm you sorry. Would. At a convention in 1876 of the AOH. 
They didn't have the time. Molly Maguire's was condemned. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's what we got for you. Find us on all of the social media places: Facebook, Instagram, we not the Twitter TikTok because yet. we don't like we don't like we don't do the Twitter. I mean, we don't no. have a TikTok yet, but we need one. I need to we get do. on there and tell you scary stories. That's what I do best in life is scary stories. I feel like our con- like content would work really well. On it probably would work very well. Short one minute bursts. Give us some info. Do you want us to make a TikTok? Let us know what you think. Hmm. And maybe I will. Hold on. I didn't make the reference. Uh, what, what was the spy's name again? Oh, uh, McParlin. He was sus. Okay, there we go. We got the young he was people sus. in. Now we got the young people in because <laughs> we got it now. We got the young people. What's going on? He was sus. <laughs> <laughs> we used to wear sus. We got the buzzword. See, word. kids? We are cool. Oh, we're hip. We're oh, hip. Man. We're I hip pl- to the slang of the time. I play Among Us. Yes. <laughs> How do you do, fellow kids? How do you do, fellow children? <laughs> I, too, am cool. (laughs) We also have a Patreon page, if you want to join us there, where we just posted a bonus episode called Love the Skin You're In. Somebody had to do it for for a school assignment, and so, you know what? We did it good, and we talked about skin diseases. If you are interested in hearing about that, then uh, if if you want to know what Argeria is... Well, you can find that I'm, out on patreon.com slash history by idiots. Yeah, go find us there. And look us up on YouTube, of course. So we're we're kind of here and there in a lot of places nowadays. Josh and I are actually getting ready to go on a ghost investigation trip to yes. Cynthiana to Ross Opera House. So we'll do some stuff and give you some history and maybe show you some spooky stuff too if you're interested in that. So spooky. let us know. Send us some emails, do all the things. You know, yep. we love you. And thank you, Trey Wilson, yes, for thank you, Trey Wilson. Yeah. hanging out with us. Well, with that being said, we'll bring it to a close like we always do. Love history. Love your library. And love yourself.